note to the Colossians. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Let us pray. Lord Christ, Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that you sent your Son into our world. Pray, Lord, that you would send him now into this place, into our hearts, that our life would truly be hidden in Christ, and that we would know him in the power of his resurrection. Raise us from lethargy, Lord, and raise even the dead to life this morning. Open my mouth to speak your gospel and open the ears of your people that they might receive and in hearing they might live. And we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please be seated. So uh, we've got to be really deliberate about things when we come together as Christians, as a Christian body, about what exactly Easter means. You know, I still, um, for the life of me, you hear all these accounts, but I still don't really know why we have uh, eggs and bunnies and little ducks and all that. <laughs> And don't get me wrong, they're nice and it's cute and it's fine. We got eggs for the kids after church. So, you know, I haven't banished that or anything. But we, we, we got to be clear, you know, because um, really, Easter's really vague. Even the name itself, right? Um, what does it mean? Is this like, does it mean like our hope that things will eventually sort of turn around in our lives? Things won't be quite so bad? Uh, maybe better luck is coming your way, or maybe this is the birth of new opportunities. Is this what we're talking about here? Um, is it the beauty of a new generation in the springtime? You know, the way we treat it, it's almost like uh, Jesus died and rose again to inspire you to believe that things will turn around and get slightly better in the next few weeks. Right? So we, our society treats it, you know. And, and it seems like modern conceptions of Easter are born to do with the portrayal of spring and Bambi. You remember that in the old cartoon where everybody's Twitter painted and there's new babies everywhere and whatever, right? Everybody's falling in love. And... No, <laughs> Our celebration of Easter sometimes seems to have more to do with that than it does the teaching of the Bible. And all that stuff is cute and it's fun, but ultimately it's a distraction from the real thing, from what the Bible has to say. Because Easter, according to the Bible, is about what God has done in Jesus Christ for us right it's about his victory over sin and death but it's about even more than that right because that talks about the past that talks about the beginning of our salvation and his victory over the grave and over sin right and he conquered sin and death so that we could be free but the question there still remains free for what right it doesn't really give us much of an answer if we leave it at that we start to get a little more traction if you realize that uh, Jesus rising from the dead, as the Bible says, is the first fruits of those who will also rise from the dead. That means all those who believe in him will raise one day from their graves like he did. That is essential core Christian teaching. It has to do with our future. When the heavens and the earth are restored and they're made new and God will raise up our bodies and make them uh, restored and perfect, and he'll put our perfected souls back into our perfect. And we'll be in a place that's better than the Garden of Eden, and we'll be there forevermore. So that is our future. That is the future that Easter points to. But what about today? What about right now? Right? I want to get inside Mary's head for a little bit and sort of understand what was going on in her heart when. When she said, it suddenly dawned on her who was talking to her in the garden that day. You know, when he said her name, Mary. Wouldn't you love to hear Jesus say your name like that, the risen Christ? See, Mary, and then her eyes are opened, right? And she, she can barely take it in, but she knows that it's him. She knows that he's raised from the dead. And she spent the rest of her life unpacking the implications of that. But something began in her mind and in her heart that day. Something surged within. Right? What happened to her at that moment? What was she enjoying immediately? Her eyes were opened. And her ears were opened to see who it was in front of her. See, understanding that is the secret to a deeper understanding of Easter. This is a deeper doctrine, a deeper teaching. And I'm sad to say it's much neglected today. But I've been reflecting on it a lot the last few weeks and, and I want to share it with you because we have to get this. We have to get this essence of Easter. Um, 
It's our loss if we don't know it. Our Christian lives are so much poorer for not knowing it. Ignorance is costly. All right, but this, this deeper teaching about Easter in the present uh, provides the immediate relevance of the Easter to us, and it describes the highest and loftiest aspect of the Christian life in this world. So what is it? Well, Paul gives us a hint this morning in our epistle reading. You might open your bulletin up and look at that Colossians reading and follow along with the logic here. He gives us a clue what, he, what, what this is when he says that when you came to faith, he says, you have died, you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, when he appears, you also will appear with him in glory. So you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Is it what he's saying there is that when a person comes to genuine faith in God, genuine faith in, in what Jesus Christ did, um, God kills our old mindset. It's now gone forever. It's dead. It's gone. And the old ways of thinking, the, our old motivations, all of it is gone. And now something new has taken its place, something alive, right? And now the believer's life is hidden with Christ in God. You see that location there? Who our life is with and, and where it is in God? His, his language, he's very deliberate with his language. And he says, Christ, who is your life, that little parenthetical phrase there, who is your life, right? See, when we're brought to faith by God, the old us is gone, and now, literally, Christ is our life. He doesn't mean that in sort of a, a casual way, like Jesus is our obsession. Oh, I'm just, Jesus is my life, I'm so obsessed with him. He doesn't mean, you know, like I can be obsessed with barbecue or something, right? Um, he doesn't mean it's my motivation, Simply, or, or my inspiration, or anything like that. I, mean, I hope it's all those things for you. But he doesn't mean that kind of thing. Jesus is my life. He knows it's not a figure of speech. He means literally, Jesus is the life force of your soul. I mean, literally, he is your life. This is true of everyone who truly believes in Jesus Christ. He is your life. Now, how do I get all that in just a few words, huh? if I just put a bunch of stuff in there. No, I've been reading the rest of the Bible and bringing it to bear on these verses to help unpack what Paul means here. He gets more specific in Ephesians 1. And he's praying that the, the Christians he's writing to in this old city would uh, be given the gift to understand what has already happened to them in the past, this life of Christ within them. He says he wants them to understand what's already been given to them in faith. He says it is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. What kind of power is that? He says, it's according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So what Paul is saying is that the very life force, the very power that rose Jesus bodily from the dead, right, that restored his broken and maimed body, breathed life into it again and put his soul back in it, and then, then it burst forth out of the tomb forevermore. That very same power that rose him from the dead is now working within all those who believe through their faith, through his power working within the individual believer. And it's the very life of Christ himself. That is what's working and the faithful. In Hebrews, it's called the power of an indestructible life. It's a, that's one of my favorite phrases in the whole Bible. This is what is working inside us. And, you see, and it's not just His power. Now, because it is in us and it belongs to us, it is our life too, this indestructible life. See, when we believe and understand that the cross applies to us, you know, that it applies to me, that it applies to you, when that dawns on us and the conviction settles in that we're the objects of God's mercy and love, and that means that this life of Christ, this power of this indestructible life is already within us, working on us, working in us, and now it's no longer possible to answer the question when someone says, who are you? Now we always ought to think, well, I am a man or a woman in Christ. I am in Christ. Right? That was Paul's favorite way of referring to himself. He calls himself a man in Christ. 
It's now our identity when this life is in us. And this is what the Bible teaches, that the, that the Christian enjoys a living, vital, spiritual union with the living and resurrected Jesus right now. That is the present power of Easter. Is this vital, living, inseparable connection that we enjoy with our Lord. This is what Jesus meant in John 15 when he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, you see that? Whoever abides in me and I in him, see that union there? Mutual abiding in one another. Can't even tell where one begins and the other ends. Right? This is what he's talking about. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. It's like my arm, what can it do? If I chopped it off, what could my arm do? It's not connected to the life force, right? There's no, there's no blood, the nerves are severed, and there's nothing in there. It's just a chunk of meat and bone on the floor. It's kind of gruesome, isn't it? Well, it still works, so I'm okay. But, you know, it, that, that's the, the vital nature of this union he's talking about. You know, if you go break a branch off a tree, it's the same thing, right? It's not going to produce anything. And no stick, no, no branch or limb or no body part is going to do anything, have life in it, if it's not connected and filled with the same vital life force of the main organism. That is the nature of our union with Christ. And the Bible uses lots of different images to describe the same connection, the same union with Jesus. It talks about it in terms of a, a husband and a wife. Right? Or like body parts, like a head and a body. You know, if you come up and kick me in the shin... I'm not going to say, hey, you hit the shin. I'm going to say, no, you hit my shin. You hit me, right? It's part of me. Yeah, you can cut my leg off or whatever, but, you know, that's still mine, right? And it, and it belongs on me. It's still part. He uses, they, they use this body parts analogy. Um, um, a father united with his children. If you're a parent, you know something of what that feels like. The connection you have with your kids. Right? Even uses, like, governmental language, like a federal representative. The Bible's full of this kind of imagery, and it uses all kinds of images. And the fact that it has to use so many different metaphors and analogies shows that the nature of this union that, the Christ, that, that Christ has with the Christian defies human understanding and defies human language. That's why the scriptures have to use so many different images to illustrate it and try to explain it to us because it blows our minds. We don't know how it works. I don't know how it works exactly. The Bible's giving me all these images so I know something about how it works. But what it is in itself, maybe we'll understand in the next life. I don't know. But the doesn't take away from the fact that it is real and it is vital. Right? It's something you can't quite understand, but you can experience it and know it. You see, we're so united to him. That again, to get, think about the marriage analogy for a minute. Let's say uh, before I was married, I was deeply in debt. All right, and let's say Jackie was a billionaire. All right, when I, when I marry Jackie, what does she get? My debt, right? But guess who's a rich guy after he marries Jackie? This guy, right? I'm not, unfortunately. <laughs> but you see how that works? I mean, that's, that's something that gets, begins to get at the way in which this works with Jesus Christ in this union that the soul has with our Lord, our risen Lord. You know, we're so united in him that he takes on our debt, our sin, but then he, he bestows our, his riches onto us and they become ours. And so that's why on the cross, he's crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It wasn't his sin, it was mine and yours that caused him to cry out like that, but he owned it, right? Why have you forsaken me? He hadn't done anything wrong, you did, I did. But still he owned it. You see that union is so tight. And now we're reckoned righteous because of what he gives to us. I mean, this is more intimate even than a marriage. It's more enduring. So, and this is what Jesus, something like Jesus prayed in John 17, when he's praying to the Father about his disciples and all who would believe in him through them. He says, The glory, Father, that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. He means all of us one with the Father in our union with Jesus Christ. This is why Peter can say that we are partakers of the divine nature. That's some seriously high doctrine right there. 
But we've got to know this for our Christian lives. Right? This activates in our lives the moment that the grace of God kicks in and converts the human soul. And when that moment happens, instantly, immediately, the Christian is included in everything that happened to Christ. I don't know, again, how it works, but it goes back in time, that union. Right? And so when, when we believe, we find that we were there on the cross, we were there in the tomb, we were there when he burst out of the tomb. That vital connection is secure, and it transcends time and space. How it works, I don't know, but this is what the Bible teaches, and I have the conviction that it's true. See, everything that happened to Jesus physically, we undergo spiritually now and then physically at the end of our lives, and we raise again, right? This is how Paul describes it in Colossians 2. He says, you have been filled in him. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were, also, you were also raised with him through faith and the powerful working of God, it says, who raised him from the dead, and you, who were dead in your trespasses, God has made you alive together with him. You see how that language there, with him? I mean, how does this come about? Well, God is decreed, he decreed it from all eternity, from before the foundation of the world. He knew that Nina and uh, you know, and Amanda and all the rest, you know, that would truly believe in him, right? Were there, he had us in mind from the, before the beginning of the world. And he has decreed this to be so, that this would happen. So it's been secure from there. Um, and then it comes to us through what theologians call effectual grace. That's when the grace takes effect in our hearts and our minds. It's that moment of conviction and belief when we truly trust in him, right? And this is the personal call of God on a human soul. And it produces this firm persuasion of the heart that I am reconciled to God because of what Jesus Christ has done. And now I have his very life flowing within me and I am united to him and my fate is his fate. When this conviction settles in you, that's when it takes effect. And that's when we're, we're united to him. And the Bible is also clear that this results in a permanent union. This is permanent it's throughout the New Testament, you see it, but it's best described, I think, maybe in a verse for today. Colossians 3, you might follow it with me. At the beginning, he says, you have died. That's past tense, right? When, when Jesus died, you were there with him in some spiritual, mystical way. And when, he, when an effectual grace came to you, it activated it, and you were there. It says, you have died. That's the past. Your life is hidden with Christ and God. You hear that present tense? See, you've got to pay attention to your grammar because it really helps. Has died, is hidden with God in Christ, or with Christ and God. And then you get the future tense. Paul says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, when he comes back again, you also will appear with him in glory. There you have it. Past, present, and future. All are covered by this union that we have now with Jesus Christ through his life dwelling within us. What does this mean for me and for you? I found a great line by the uh, great um, 17th century English theologian John Owen. He put it this way. And he's, he's thinking again of the, the marriage analogy the, to help to understand this union. And he thinks about um, when David was young, before he was king, he was one of Saul's men, the current king, and being grateful for his exploits in the battlefield, Saul gave his daughter in marriage to David. And this is really something. This is like better than Meghan Markle marrying into the royal family, right? I mean, at least she came from Hollywood. David came from like the fields with the sheep, right? He was stinky. Uh, I mean, he was a good looking guy, but he was pretty dirty and smelly and and he was inconsequential. And nobody even thought of him half the time, yeah? Oh, he, he's baby brother. He's out there taking care of things, you know? Um, and he says this, you know, he says, this is what John Owen, how he puts it. David says, in an earthly temporary concern, when Saul's daughter is given to him, he says, what am I? And what is my father's family? That I should be son-in-law to the king being a poor man and lightly esteemed. He says, what am I? Yeah, and he says, how much more may a sinner say, what am I? Poor, sinful dust and ashes. 
one that deserves to be lightly esteemed by the whole creation of God. What am I that I should be thus united unto the Son of God and thereby become his son by adoption? What am I that this should happen to me? Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is the nature that you know what it produces in us. And it has so many effects in those who truly believe and are mindful of this and meditate on it, this union we have with Jesus. Um, one thing that comes to mind, it gives us security and confidence. I mean, we, we've heard in the Bible, it said before, that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? We've heard that before. So think about it. If you're permanently united to Christ, right? And Christ is seated at the right hand of God, as we heard earlier. He's completely untouchable now by sin or disease or sadness or insecurity or death or any of that stuff. If that's true of him, and you're united to him, guess who it's also true of? You and me. Now, yes, we will someday die. You know, this body will, will fail me eventually, and I'll lay in the ground. But that's not the thing that's most true about me. That's not the heart of who I am. That's just a part of who I am. The real me is spirit, right? We so privilege the body, we forget this. But really, the most important thing about us is that we are spirit. C.S. Lewis put it this way. You don't have a soul. You have a body. You've got to reverse our thinking there. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and so if this is true of us, and, and the Bible tells us that we're united to Christ and we're seated even with him in the heavenly places, this is our primary reality. We don't think that way. But the Bible's telling us we need to start thinking that. That's why Paul tells us today, set your mind on things above. Realize this, you need to live according to it. If we can get our head into this space, if we can literally set our mind on things above, right, then we can begin to shrug off the temporary sufferings and inconveniences and annoyances of this world. The problems we face, you're like, oh, yeah, this, this is really terrible, but compared to that, whatever. Right? Yes, this is awful. But compared to what's coming, compared to what I am now currently enjoying in Christ, come what may, it's fine. I'll be all right. You know? Our security is beyond secure. And this union with Christ ought to be the foundation of our entire lives. And this union with Christ also means, as we saw on Monday, Thursday, you might go back and listen to my sermon if you, this piques your interest, but we have a new affection. We have a new heartbeat inside of us, right? This new life has a new love and a new will. Um, before we come to faith, we tend to think if we're interested in God at all, we tend to think, well, maybe this is desirable because I can get God to help me with things in my life. See, we, we want God to come into our lives so that we can sort of get help on our terms and our plans. Right? That's how the non-believer tends to think if they're thinking favorably about God at all. That's how they tend to think. Now, for those who are united to Christ, God is desirable simply because he's him. You know, Jesus was going off to, uh, to pray all the time. He was constantly sneaking away and spending late nights in prayer. I don't think it was because he was stressed out. I don't think it's because he's worried about anything or troubled or whatever. I think uh, he was there primarily because he loved communing with his father. He'd rather be praying, and enjoying his union with his father, his heavenly father, than sleeping. He's like, this is better than sleep. I'll sleep when I'm dead, literally. <laughs> Three days, he got a long nap, right? I'll sleep later. Right now, I want to enjoy my real life. Right? I've been out laboring and sweating and all the crowds of people and all that, and that's all good. He says, I just want to be with my father. And this is why he would steal away in the night and go pray, because that's where he belonged. That's where he felt most at home. Right? That's where he truly lived, because it was his life. That's why he did it. And the same holds true for the one who is truly united to Christ. The same desire is birthed within them and it begins to grow as we go through our lives by God's grace. It comes to characterize and even dominate our lives. You know, I, 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 I long to be complimented by someone saying that I take this Jesus thing too seriously. All right? I'll take that one. 
Um, Paul said it this way. He says, yeah, there's some good work I could do on the earth and all that, and I'll be here as long as I'm here. But really, he says, my desire is to depart and be with Christ. It's far better for me. That's what I truly want. That's Philippians 1.23. David knew it too, way back hundreds of years before Christ, but God in his grace had, had already produced this kind of faith, even dimly in his heart, but he, he had it. And, and, and just having a dim faith, and not even seeing the details of what Jesus would do. David says this out of the faith he was given. He says, one thing I have asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the fair beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And he's not talking about going to church. He's talking about being with God. Psalm 84, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yea, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. This is the kind of new affections that are birthed within when that union of Christ takes hold of us. Right? It also produces um, higher and enduring affections for better things, right? Stuff that's not in this world. So it's better is out of and beyond this world. That's why Paul says to us this morning, if then you have been raised with Christ, if that union is real, then act like it. He says, set your mind on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Right? That's why he says in Philippians 4, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's anything that's excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise. In other words, he's saying if there's anything that comes from God that you're mindful of, he says, think about these things. Set your mind on them. And this also produces glad repentance. Romans 6, he very much has his union with Christ in mind. So if this is true, he says, then you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to to God in Christ Jesus. See, there it is, in Christ Jesus. Dead to sin and alive to God. In Philippians 3, he says, For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. You see, there it is, it's everywhere. And that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And other things, you know, it produces uh, an awareness that this world is not your home. You ever feel that way? We're just pilgrims passing through, my friends. That is our real life. That is what's true. That is what's real. That is where we're going. And, and that union with Christ produces a longing for a country that we've never seen, but we intuitively know by God's grace is there and is waiting for us. And, and also it provides an awareness of this union of Christ pr provides uh, a sense that we don't belong to ourselves anymore. I don't belong to me. Just like when I got married to my wife, I'm not solo anymore, am I? I belong to her. And if I start talking to girls and flirting, whatever, she can smack me because I belong to her, right? I don't belong to myself anymore. So much more true even with Jesus. I don't belong to myself and I belong to him. He bought me with his blood. I'm his. He is mine. Right? Everywhere I go, he goes, right? And, and, and it produces an attitude. It's like, I don't have to obey God. You're like, oh, I better do the right thing, whatever, you know? No, I get to please God. You see the difference there? Have to versus get to. I get to please him. I get to obey him. I get to do his will. How awesome is that? Right? Being mindful of this union produces this kind of attitude. And it brings a whole lot of virtues and qualities too, right? The very conditions of heaven, when we're mindful of this union of Christ, begin to glow within us, right? Things like peace and joy, and hope. And here's how Paul puts it in Colossians 1. God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. Well, what is this glorious mystery, Paul? He says, the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you. Isn't that wonderful? Which is the hope of glory. And so famous, we'll end with this one. Galatians 2, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. You see, he says, I'm a man in Christ. That's his identity. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself 
So my prayer this Easter is that uh, it will all be immediately present to you. Please don't forget about this over lunch, all right? I mean, think about it. Talk about it with your friends and family members. Meditate on this thing, this profound reality that's present in all those who truly believe. If that's not you, I pray that this is awakening a desire in you to know it and to want that union, that connection, the beginning of that life flowing within you. But my prayer is that you will go forth understanding the implications for now, that you are a man or a woman or a boy and girl in Christ. All right? What's happened to him has happened to you. Where he is, you are, and where you are, he is. And we'll spend eternity rejoicing in this, reveling in this, or even exploring the depths of this. So my hope is that this empowers your Christian life today. That it makes everlasting eternal life very large in your eyes. And the problems with this world and the stresses and anxieties and fears that you have very small in comparison. And this will begin to characterize your very life so that we can walk in victory because he is risen from the dead. And if you're trusting in him, you are a man or a woman in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what stupendous grace you have given us and the powerful working of your Son. Help us to believe. Help us to treasure these things and keep them at the forefront of our hearts and at the for forefront of our minds and on the tip of our tongue that I am a man in Christ. I am a woman in Christ. Make this our foundation, Lord. Make this our reality and make this our very life because we have died and our life is hidden with Christ in you. Make this true for us, Lord. Make us to know it and feel it and rejoice in it. And we ask this for Jesus' sake.